Still running on the dog table. No, no, I, I need I just counted the rows. I need rows. It's okay. not very good. It's about databases and stuff. So it's not So guys, can, can you come to the front? Yeah, no. Because because if not then we're just speaking there and we're all here. So. Um, okay. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome to this tiny audience session of uh, migrating a running service uh, towards AWS. We're going to talk about how we migrate a model to Amazon from um, the classic data center solution, like touchable hardware to non-touchable hardware. Uh, my name is Nick Pinoff and this is Ricardo Amaro. Can you hear me just fine? We're uh, recording, I suppose. So just a little bit about me. I currently live in Ghent. Uh, I see one other person here that also lives in Gantu. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, but also lives here in Barcelona for two years, um, also in Lisbon, um, and more recently also in Boston. Uh, I've been with Drupal for eight years. I started out in university. It uh, was a little awkward in the beginning. Um, but then moved into the search space. Um, and more recently, I moved into Malum and also the Acquia Lyft product. Um, and I'm a principal software engineer at Acquia. So it's very good to be back here in Barcelona. Spent a lot of time partying, um, a little bit of Drupal uh, with a company called Ati Sistemas before. I don't know if anyone heard of that. Um, well, it was fun. But I'm not going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about Malm. Um, and I suppose most of you know Malm. Is there anyone who doesn't know Malum? So that's good, right? Like it, it's your spam protection uh, service. And we, we try to offer fully managed software as a service, um, which is free and has a paid version as well, uh, and tries to come back with a result whether your comment is fine, spam, ham, or bad, called spam. 
uh, under a 50 millisecond ratio. That's what we try to offer. Um, and it's built in Java. So I'm going to let Ricardo introduce himself. Hello. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Ricardo. Uh, I live in Portugal, Lisbon, um, with my family. I also try to facilitate the Drupal local community. Uh, I'm on seven years now um, using Drupal. Um, I'm an early adopter from Linux since the 90s, and I work for years now in, uh, in Acquia, uh, where I am a senior, senior tier two ops engineer. So um, before we go into the actual migration, let's, let us give you the big picture on how uh, was the state of Malum uh, when it was acquired. Operations is a very important part of Acquia engineering. To operation arrives um, basically every product that needs love and also some unknowns. Um, Malum was not different. Uh, so here's the, te the text that we had uh, some time um, in our wiki um, and just explain how we were going to handle the things for Molum um, um, in terms of operation. And you can see that we were only responsible from the, Mol the Molum servers being up or down like any um, and the basic services being available sites such as SSH, MySQL, Apache, Nginx, uh, and if further problems would, would arrive, then we should escalate directly to the uh, Molum engineer. The whole infrastructure looked like this, uh, which is a result of a lot of engineering uh, work during four years uh, before us. Uh, we are not focusing today on the diagram itself, but on the complexity that it was, especially because it was on classic data, uh, classic data center uh, across multiple regions. So, you know, like uh, normal servers <laughs> to manage. Uh, Molum had just one Java engineer uh, and some freelancers to help out uh, with the building of this product. Uh, and this person was really not hired to be available 24-7. However, most of the problems didn't uh, the, however, most of the problems didn't uh, uh, reside on the product itself, uh, but on third-party software uh, such as MySQL, Cassandra, and Genex, etc. So, let's suppose this Java engineer was a cat. After uh, Acquia acquired Molum, Ops supported the infrastructure and the Java engineer was the expert on the Molum code base. However, 95% of everybody's time was dealing with alerts and outages uh, that were caused by, by uh, infrastructure issues, uh, power lines that were cut, uh, disk failures, uh, lack of automation. So, and did I, manage, did I mention this is non-cloud environment? So you can imagine. So this is a graph uh, of alerts uh, that were generated uh, by, uh, by the Molum infrastructure. Uh, and it, uh, it shows uh, how this was working while we were receiving like 20 million HTTP requests per day, uh, eight, 8 million of spam requests per day. And in, in, that, in that case, the worst day is there we had like 300 uh, alerts to deal with. And you can see that point there when we switched to AWS, uh, how we, we were able to reduce uh, the amount of alerts um, on, the, on the ops team. So less wake-ups, of course. Also, some of the problems were, were really not automated due, due to the lack uh, of expertise on third-party software. So this is one uh, really funny example of, uh, of this case. Uh, th this one example was continuously waking, waking up uh, operations at 3 a.m., so it's really 
uh, not very good. Um, notice that reading these instructions at that time of the night uh, was really bizarre. And uh, who has tried, who from the audience has tried to run rm-rf on something at the middle of the night here? Like. <laughs> and with a star. <laughs> so yeah, bad, bad things can happen there, that's, that's, that's for sure. So we got rid of that. We're, we're just giving the bad picture here, of course. So now to the good picture. All right, so we prepared some exercise for you. So you're all DevOps or engineers or anything else. You build HA applications, right? Who doesn't build HA applications? OK, so I'll skip you. That's fine. <laughs> no. What we're going to do here is we're going to build a highly available audience application. And we're going to do this with cards. All right. So one row is one component. And I'll show you the components later. And I need to be able to take down one human. And the audience application should still work. OK? Um, the order is important. So I want you to start from the front to the back. Uh, and these are the components that I want you to order yourself by. OK? Um, so you guys understood? I'll, I'll answer some questions if you have. But it should be pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's, it's easy. We just delivered the car cards, and you, you figure out how to do that. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Here, one more, Ricardo. Okay, so you can all read what's in the cards, right? Don't mix them up because you, like, you can only have two components for the whole row. So each part is one region, all right? Your USEs, for example, your Europe. Um, and I want you to start with the first row. So what service are you? So you're a varnish? So when I type in google.com? <laughs> yes. So hold it up high, right? Okay, so that's, but that's not HA yet. So I, I want you to do this exercise right now to make sure that the first row is HA, the second row is HA, etc. So first thing is DNS, second thing is okay, and then the third one. So I expect two cards in every row, right? At least, I guess, because if I take one down. Everything is down. Single point of failure, that's not what we want. They keep it up high enough so that people can see. Third row. It's in. Uh, it's behind. Yes. Some companies use varnish as the load balancer. You know. So. <laughs> yes. All right. So well, I see web, and then I don't see anything anymore. So DB, I, I only see one cache. You have multiple caches. Oh, three caches. That's good. Four caches. All right. So if I shoot down one cache, you're dead. So how does that work with the web server? How does the web server know which cache to go to? It's a difficult question, I know. So you need actually another load balancer there with the caching. You should, should probably answer that. Yeah, yeah I, I did answer that myself. But you need another load balancer with the caches. So you can see it already gets complex. And we only have six components and a pretty small audience. You remember that diagram from before from Alan? <laughs> so this really wasn't an easy exercise to move all these single components from one infrastructure to another without taking it down. Yeah. All right? Um, you can keep the cards if you want. Uh, 
Um, so I'm going to talk about ephemeralism, this whole cloud thing we all heard about. It's really not that physical server that you don't own anymore. It's a thing that can always disappear. Ephemeralism is, is a word that I had a really hard time understanding, and like, Peter Wellen is here in the audience, and he first told me, oh, let's make the server ephemeral. What, what, what are you saying? I don't, <laughs> I've never heard of that word. Um, but in Amazon, servers can just disappear, right? Um, so this book was an eye-opener to me. And um, I really recommend you to, to go and get that book if you're into building infrastructures, uh, building um, cloud systems uh, or distributed systems. Uh, I won't go into detail what it actually offers, but it, it tries to tell the optimal story, the most optimal story of a distributed system, even though those technologies might not exist today. It doesn't talk about technologies itself. So this is one of the, the theories that goes into that book. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with it, um, but it was important for me to understand this theorem. Um, so for example, if you have MySQL, you need consistent consistency. You need always that, that right. Afterwards, you read it, you need to get that right. Malum is not such a system. We have eventual consistency, um, but it could be that a spam or two spams go into the system, and we don't care about the order how it actually is processed. Um, that's as much as I will say about that cap theorem, but look it up if you're interested. So fast forward, this is where we want to go towards, uh, and I explain what this all means as we continue. Is there anyone who knows all these Amazon services uh, or who works with Amazon on a daily basis except for the Acquia guys? <laughs> so no one outside from those three has ever worked with Amazon? Maybe you know EC2, the virtual machines, right? Um, but there's, there's more, and I'll try to explain it. For Malum, for this whole migration, it all starts with CloudFormation. CloudFormation is a, a kind of a language which is built in JSON, or it uses JSON as a convention. Um, and we use it to spin up all these resources that you've seen in that diagram. So um, as an uh, like example, um, you can see here, this is how you define um, and I think it's a load balancer. So here you define the load balancer and it will spin up that load balancer for you. The good thing that it is versioned, so whenever you make a change to your infrastructure, you actually know what change you made to your infrastructure. Remember in Amazon you don't have that single guy you can call to actually change a configuration or to replace the plug or to do anything. Um, so CloudFormation was a critical key component for us to make sure that we went on the right route and to make sure we could repeat, repeat, repeat what we did. We could throw away everything and start again within five to 10 minutes. Um, so the first part of the migration was to switch these API nodes um, and they consist from auto-scaling groups, which is, for example, if you have more load, you add more servers. Uh, Elastic Load Balancer, which is basically the load balancer you had in front of you. Um, Elastic Compute 2, it's called. It's just VM on Amazon. Um, and then uh, we have the Java application on top of it. So if we continue, the first part we actually do is to um, devise our network infrastructure. Um, Amazon has a server called service called VPC, and you can define subnets, internal IPs, external IPs. It's this one networking infrastructure where you define all your uh, architecture in, where you put all your servers in, your databases, etc. Um, it's very important that you start, if you start with Amazon, to start with VPC because some of the new regions like Frankfurt only have VPC. Uh, it might not make sense to you now. Maybe you start in two weeks and then you realize, shit, I should have listened to the guy. Um, so this is how, more or less how it looks like. So you see there's internal IP addresses. Some of the servers within Malum don't need exposure to the public internet, so they don't need a public IP. For example, that load balancer of the cache that we had in the back, there's no reason that should have a public IP. You shouldn't be able to get there, and you have to first go into um, your instance. No, like the ELB is not something you log into, so it can be internal. No. Um, also, again, you can define this with CloudFormation. Um, and then we get into the, the database part of things. So when you do a migration with data, it's always hard. 
um, and Malum stores some of that data in MySQL. It stores some of that data uh, or stored some of that data in Cassandra. And we couldn't have rights to both MySQL database at the same time. Like we couldn't do it in the old data center and to the new one because at some point maybe we would have a mismatch and then it's really hard. So the first part of our migration was to actually move MySQL to Amazon and we used this service called RDS. Um, it's purely MySQL and Amazon. There is nothing difficult about it. There, it's MySQL. Um, you can also define it as being HA and there's a whole bunch of metrics and other configurations you can put in there. So to continue, the biggest part of, of Malum is storing those comments, analyzing those comments, making sure that you have the right captcha, all like this instant data retrieval. And have, have you worked with Cassandra before? You've heard of it? Okay, so it, it's kind of a key storage, NoSQL, all this buzzword thingy. Um, DynamoDB is exactly the same, but then the Amazon version of it. The good part for us was we are no experts in Cassandra. We are expert in the software. And Cassandra was the biggest pain point for us. Like we had no clue really how to configure it optimally. Um, so going to our just like a service that in the end has the same price tag while you get the added benefit of some people behind it that actually know what they do, it's, it's great. So we read this, this is Cassandra without the alerts. Um, so once we had our database moved to Amazon, we decided, okay, so our key storage solution, we don't really care if there's some inconsistency, so we will write to the both places at the same time. Does that make sense with that cap theorem in mind? So some of things really have to be consistent, like a bank. Some of this, like comments, we don't really care if it's like, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Um, so that allowed us to do load testing on a service we didn't know. Uh, and the tricky thing about DynamoDB, if you ever get to it, is that it has fixed limits. So you set, for example, 100 writes per second. And once you go over those 100 writes per second, the API will tell you, eh, you're not allowed to do this. And if you're used to running your own software, that's not something you, like, you can think of. The limit would be your CPU or, or like anything else, but not the API telling you, no, you have your limit. Um, and it gets more tricky when you get into the details of DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is this massive service and you don't know if it's one server or four servers or even more. You also don't know how many partitions it has and it works with partitions. If you have 100 writes per second, you have four partitions, each partition has 25. If you write to one specific item more than 25 times a second, you reach your limit, right? But you don't know how many partitions you have. So you have to be very careful in designing your system so that you don't write to the same key many times or you don't read to the same key many times. It's different thinking. Um, so as we move on, we also had issues with DynamoDB as it didn't have a time to live. For people that work with, for example, Redis, you probably know time to live. Your store key, maybe 20 minutes later, it's gone. If you have 20 million requests a day, you don't want these things to live forever because you pay for your data. Um, and DynamoDB, doesn't have that support. It, it doesn't auto-delete these things. So we came up with a solution called Dynam like Dynamic DynamoDB Manager, and we have rotational tables. So every day a new table gets created, and after a week that table gets deleted. Um, because iterating over every item, we would reach our limit. Right? So it, it, there's a lot of thinking that comes with it if you use a service. This software is open source uh, and available if you ever need uh, this. So moving on, we have the hard part done. The data is done. So we can move on to the, the stateless API servers. Um, and this is what I think you guys might be familiar with, the regular EC2 instances. Uh, it's very easy. You spin one up. It has Linux. Uh, you start messing around, and then you don't remember what you did. Right? No? <laughs> so, 
and then um, well, let's try not to do that. So what we have as a vision for EC2 is only in emergencies you go and log in and make a change. Um, if you spin up the service, it should configure everything from the start, right? Um, if you want to make a change, you delete the server, you start a new one. Um, if you want to do an update, you delete the server, you make a new one. You want to revert the change, you delete the server, you spin up a new one with the previous version. Remember, your infrastructure is version because you have CloudFormation, so you can always go back to the previous version. Um, except for your data, that's like a wild card. You cannot really go back to the previous state of your data unless you have backups. So it's the easiest system and most known system, um, and we treat all these EC2 instances within Malum as disposable. So we can kill a single one and it will spin up a new one automatically. It can go away, and Amazon can tell us, sorry, we don't know where it is, but it's no problem. It will automatically spin up a new one because in CloudFormation we said we need a, at the minimum four servers. So this is also how it looks like for CloudFormation. If you want to mess around it at home, um, you can do so. You can copy this. I can also give you some of the, the actual text. I have to filter it, though, for some secrets. Um, and using these things with the load balancer in EC2 gives you added benefits like access logs. Um, it could be that you need to adhere to certain audit formats. Um, so it stores it to the storage system, S3 of Amazon. Have, have health checks. Uh, if it fails, for example, in Malm, if one API server for some reason goes down, as in the software goes down, Amazon takes down the server and it will automatically spin up a new one. We don't care if Tomcat crashed. We are not restarting Tomcat. We're killing the server. Too bad for Tomcat. Um, that's, that's what it does. Um, it also has connection draining, so whenever it kills it, it actually waits until the connections are completed. Um, and some more stuff. So you think, okay, so this server, you're configured with Puppet or Chef or Ansible, right? Because that's what we all use. Well, that's not true. We're not using any Puppet, nor Chef, nor Ansible. It's all in CloudFormation. Um, we don't do any orchestration of the software. It's whenever the, the server is started, it installs the software, it starts the software, and that's where it stops. Um, it's a little different from what I think you're used to, or maybe not, depending on how you work. Um, but f like for us, this was an eye-opener. We don't have to mess around with a Puppet server anymore, because the Puppet server, I don't know how you experience it, but to me it's horrible that it needs that SSL communication all the time, and if your server dies, you have to redo all your clients. Um, Chef is a little better probably, but you still have to manage that Chef server. And with this, we actually remove the part of the infrastructure. Um, also, metrics is important. So Amazon comes with a server called CloudWatch, um, and it's, it's great, but expensive. And um, on the servers itself, we have a software called Diamond, and Diamond can get the metrics and send it to either CloudWatch or StatsD. Um, you can see you can get like, pretty in detail, but this Diamond tool actually creates the alerts for us on the fly. So remember, in the middle of the night, the server goes away, starts a new service, starts a new server, it starts the service, it adds the alarms, um, and it, like, it, it just does everything automatically so that if something ever would happen that needs to reach out to operations, it can. Um, and then alarms, we use PagerDuty. Maybe that's uh, known to some of you. I'm not going really into detail. Um, how much time do I have left? Well, Probably not much, right? No. Okay. Well, well so there's alarms. Um, who of you here are operations or actually receive alerts? <laughs> have you ever received an alert bomb? Right, so one server goes down, or service goes down, and takes down everything else, and then it's up to you to find out what actually is the problem. Uh, if you haven't had that before, I'm, I bless you. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's really horrible to get this storm. And alerts are useful if things wouldn't be connected to each other, but in our world, everything is connected to everything. Um, yeah, I can give an example. For instance, uh, we had uh, a, 
another structure, which is the search um, part. And imagine this, we had like, um, how many cores we had in Java? Like 300 cores, and we had to check for each core. Yeah, that makes sense, right? But if that Java server went down, like you had like 300 alerts just because one server went down, which was really painful because you would just need to fix that server, and <laughs> you would go like search for the right alert <clears throat> between 300 alerts. So we fixed that. That's that's fixed. That but that's an example of this uh, alert bomb. So what we've built to help operations with this is ordering in that alerts. So when, when those alerts occur, the top one is the most important one to actually look at. At 3 a.m., that's very useful. Um, so that's more or less uh, the whole infrastructure. And then like the actual migration, how do you migrate a service if you only have one endpoint? So we had api.malon.com. And we could have switched the IP on the DNS, and it could have exploded. It probably would have exploded, uh, because sending over 20 million requests from a cold service, like from, um, from a service that's running to a cold service, is asking for trouble. Um, I hope some of you cannot relate. Um, so there is this service from Dynect and also Amazon Route 52. 53 um, can return a different IP based on your geolocation. So if you're in US East and you go to api.mom.com, you get a different IP address, which is the old data center. If you were in Australia, you would get the new data center. So this is how we switched uh, Malum bit by bit without using a different domain name. Um, and it really helped us to get a small segment of our traffic onto different or the new infrastructure, do some testing, do some bug fixing, um, and not taking it down. Uh, I highly recommend this if you're actually migrating services because it's very cheap. Um, and for some reason, I, I don't know, but I haven't seen this a lot in Stack Overflow as a certain solution, but I think it's awesome. Um, so as a result, now we have like happy deving and happy opsing. And operations only jumps in to actually own operations that cannot be automated, like uh, disk size uh, or hard drive op sizes. If you spin up an instance with 100 gigs, it gets full. You still need someone to actually say, I needed 150. There is no way to currently automate that really easily. You could probably, but we haven't done it in Malum yet. Also, for example, if you have a DDoS attack um, and your auto scaling is not fast enough to react to add more servers, you can have an alert, ask ops, please add more servers. In the ideal world, all operations are automated, and developer and operations is not separated, but combined in, in one role to me. You can call it DevOps, I call it an engineer. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for listening, and hope that there's maybe some questions. And you have to go to that mic on the other end. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you can you can come here yeah. if you want. Probably. Somebody has any questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, I haven't used cloud formations, but can you go into some detail about how you do the the, the provisioning? Rather the provisioning? Than chef or puppet? Sure. So, um, cloud formation you can store it in S3, in Amazon. And in the console of Amazon or with the scripts, you can say, I want to launch this specific script now. It also allows you to do updates of certain scripts. So once you make a change, you update it to the same S3 bucket. Uh, you go into your stack and say, it, and that's in the console. It's all like in the UI or with scripts you can choose. Um, and say, I want to update this stack with this script. Um, and then it reads out that script uh, in Amazon. And the useful thing of it is that you can actually refer to sub scripts or sub files. So you can split up your CloudFormation um, files depending on the service. And maybe I can give you an example. Um, you have to move it. Yeah, I'll move it. But so this 
So, oh, I have to stop this first. Let's, one second then. For some reason it's not, oh. Very useful. This is hard. Yeah. All right, so I'm not gonna show much of the cloud formation itself because there could be some confidential stuff in there. Um, but on the left, you can see the structure, okay? So our base template is the, the base file where we define the security groups uh, and certain things that we really need in advance. The, um, the first thing that then happens is it refers to the vpc.template to create the network, um, and you can actually rely on outputs of certain substacks to go to other substacks. And Amazon or CloudFormation is smart enough to know that it has to do that first, to then provision the second thing, to then go to the third thing. Um, and then the the only script that we have here, um, this is not porn, but POM, uh, just telling you. Yeah. Why is this? Uh, okay. Yeah, so this is the only script we actually have to deploy Malum. We This is the upload to S3 script. There's no other bash scripts in there. There's no other puppet. There's no chef. There's, there's nothing else. There's nothing on your local computer that you need to rely on. If another new employee would come in, he clones the repository, he follows the steps, and he's, he's gone, like, he's live. Um, and I remember when I started with some products within Acquia, it takes much more time to actually get acquainted to certain things. Um, so I hope that answers your question a bit. It did, thank you. Any other questions? You talk about the the MySQL, and how did you manage to? I suppose that MySQL should be online all the time. Um, it was. Uh, did you move all in a single step, or had you to suffer from any latency issues when MySQL uh, was migrated, or in which order did you uh, take the MySQL migration? So. Luckily, it was all in US East. Um, so our, our database center where we were before was also more or less in the same region. Um, I think it was Philadelphia. I don't remember where uh, they were. And then the, the new database was in Virginia, uh, US East uh, from Amazon. It was the hardest problem. Um, so we had to actually have some downtime with Malum um, to say this is where it stops and we, we had a backup and then we had the, the replay of the logs for the, the last 15 minutes, for example, um, and then we were back up to speed, but we had to stop it. Um, and then f until we actually migrated everything into, to Amazon, we had a small added delay or latency towards that database. Uh, luckily, the, the service is built that way that we don't rely on MySQL for your spam request or for your comment analysis. We only add results to MySQL after the facts asynchronously. So it's only Cassandra that's like really, that needs to be available or DynamoDB. And we were able to go like to those two at the same time. Um, and then with the DNS switch, some people were in Cassandra, some people were in Dynamo, depending on where they were. Uh, uh, one question from my side. Um, did you run into any issues with the ELBs when you were switching traffic over initially? Or was it like just working without issues? What kind of issue? Um, that you have too much traffic on the ELBs. Ah. Yeah, so we warned uh, Amazon in advance. Okay. Yeah. So because we told them we're adding this amount of requests because we knew exactly how many requests we would uh, expect. There okay. is... There is a there is a process, I don't know if you all know, 
but it's called warm up. They, yep. It's not very documented, but you can just call them and say, hey, this is going to happen. Please warm up and scale it up to this uh, range, more or less. Perfect. And they will ask you what kind of connections are you going to have and all that sort of stuff. Thanks. Any other question? Last question? No? So tomorrow you all start with Amazon? <laughs> Just want to remind you, like, I'm, I'm not working for Amazon or preaching them, but some of the IDs you can also take to other data centers that offer cloud services, right? So um, I hope from this you take away that servers in, on a cloud system can go away and build your system around that. And less alerts, basically. <laughs> and less really, alerts. Really all right, thank you for your attention.